Hi, it's Eric Robbins, and the topic of this video is how I use TREs with fragile and sensitive patients. So as a little background, I'm a urologist in Southern California. I see uh, a regional um, expert in seeing cases of chronic pelvic pain. I see a lot of patients with chronic uh, functional problems. Functional problems are cases where people have real symptoms, real complaints, but on a physical exam, labs and x-rays, imaging, uh, everything looks okay, the anatomy looks okay, and yet folks have weird symptoms, weird complaints, weird bladder functions. So um, I see this cohort of patients, and among them, a lot of these patients are very sensitive and fragile. From my standpoint, as a urologist and a physician, um, I, I, my whole practice these days is based on a few tenets. Number one, the body tends to heal itself. I firmly believe that. Number two, I believe that as a result of past stressors, tensions, maybe traumas, uh, at any point in our life, particularly when we're young, our body and our physiology can go into a low-level fight-flight-free state, and this will stay on autopilot. It's like a computer program running under the surface. It will go on for years or decades and wrecks havoc on our body. So I think that many of us and many of our patients who are chronically sick, the biggest underlying issue is that our bodies are running in a low-level fight-flight-free stress physiology. And although we say that the body tends to heal itself, when it's running in a stress state, it doesn't heal itself very well. So the third tenet is, in order for my patients to ultimately heal from chronic pain, chronic problems, we have to shift their bodies and their physiology out of chronic stress physiology. And in my opinion and experience, the tension release exercises are the best way I've found of doing that. And so for the past three and a half years, um, not only did I take and, and get certified in TREs and they saved my life personally, but I've been doing them with anywhere from two to four patients a day. I find them very helpful at putting the patients in a state, in a physiology, where their body's able to heal itself. Of course, it, everything in my practice is based on you know, doing the American Urology Association guidelines, and all the patients get the normal standard of care treatments. But interestingly, uh, in the AUI, AUA guidelines for treating chronic pelvic pain, the first tier that we're supposed to do with patients is work on relaxation and stress reduction techniques. So I've taken that obviously to a much greater level than a lot of folks have. So um, who's, a, who's a fragile or sensitive patient? Well, certainly patients with any one of a number of psychologic or psychiatric disorders like anxiety or generalized anxiety disorder, depression, bipolar, post-traumatic stress disorder. By the way, if you're working with that cohort of patients, make sure that that falls within the scope of your practice, okay? Make sure you've got some training or the scope of your practice says you can and should be working with folks like that. In my own mind, I think that patients with a lot of chronic problems like chronic pain, neuropathic pain, complex regional pain syndrome, chronic musculoskeletal pain, that means back pain, neck pain, shoulder pain, etc., cetera, um, fall into this category. I think patients with significant irritable bowel syndrome, severe asthma, out of control hypertension, severe migraines, fibromyalgia, chronic disease, chronic uh, fatigue syndrome, and um, and autoimmune diseases. In my mind, almost almost the presence of those diseases to me tells me their physiology is locked in a chronic fight, flight, freeze autopilot, and there's a high higher chance they may be a fragile or sensitive patient. Okay. Now, this is the other thing, how I think about fragile, sensitive patients in my own mind. I've got to give you a little brief background on this first, okay? So basically, the model I use is this. I think many of us growing up uh, have certain things happen. Now, it may be a big T trauma, a rape, a molestation, severe neglect when you're a young child or infant, okay? For others of us, it could be there was a lot of stress in the household, mom and dad fought a lot, or you were bullied at school, or someone just wasn't there to really meet all your needs growing up, uh, something like that. So we could have big T traumas or just day-to-day -day little stressors and tensions. It could be that mom had that look, you know the one I'm talking about? You could never do anything right, she had the look at you, no one was beating you, no one was molesting you, but it was stressful, okay? Other people have stressors later in life, you know, it could be a rape, an abortion, you went and fought in a war, were robbed, mug, witnessed an accident, uh, going through medical procedures, by the way, for young kids can be extremely stressful and traumatic. There was a study 
not too long ago that showed that 30 to 50 percent of kids undergoing orthopedic surgery start showing signs of post-traumatic stress disorder. But the bottom line is this, when you're going through something that at the time for you feels overwhelming, terrifying, okay, you feel powerless to do anything about it. You know, we talk about a fight or flight response, but it's a situation where you may not be able to fight and do much, you may not be able to flee and get away, and so you freeze. And there's a number of things that happen when our physiology freezes, um, it goes into a dorsal vagal um, state. It's a parasympathetic state. So folks that have a vasovagal response or a fainting response or dysautonomias or something like that, it's a, it's a bad, it's not the rest and digest parasympathetic state. It's a different part of the vagus nerve, okay? Um, but also part of what happens when we're dealing with these overwhelming emotions, sensations at the, that at the time seem like that, big parts of our musculature lock down, tighten up, and freeze. And, and Wilhelm Reich, one of the famous psychologists from the early 1900s, used the term muscular armoring. These muscles lock down and tighten up to hold these emotions that would otherwise be overwhelming locked in our body. They're held tightly. Now, tight muscles hurt. So, you, you, so people have something like you know back pain. Well, the reason for the pain oftentimes is tight spastic muscles in their back. People with fibromyalgias, their whole body's hurt. There's a lot of chronic muscular tension and spasm there, okay? Same frequently with headaches. Same with a lot of, a lot of these other diagnoses, okay? Now, in the big picture, it would be good for these muscles to unfreeze, for these areas of chronic tension in the neck and shoulders, in the back, in the psoas muscle, in the pelvic floor. It would be great for those muscles to relax and loosen and open up. Would that be great? This is the challenge. As these muscles start to unfreeze and open up, what may come up to someone's conscious awareness is the same overwhelming feelings and sensations that made them freeze to begin with, okay? So if you have somebody who's significantly frozen, they're locked up in their musculature, and we go to unfreeze those muscles, what may come up to their conscious awareness is the same overwhelming, scary, emotions and sensations that made them freeze to begin with, okay? I call these emotions, by the way, the deep pain. I've dealt with my own, and when this junk starts coming up, it feels terrible, it feels overwhelming, it feels out of control, you feel like you're gonna go crazy or die if you open up to this stuff, it's kind of nebulous, um, it feels like it's never gonna end, so that's the deep pain. So, a big part of my, uh, my understanding of fragile sensitive patients is that their whole bodies are locked up to keep from feeling this stuff. And as we start to get a little bit of loosening in their body, in their musculature, some of these uncomfortable feelings may come up to conscious awareness. Because of that, we want to go very, very slowly and safely with these clients, okay? Big, a big portion of my uh, client base is this type of clients. Now, by the way, what I'm telling you now is based on my own opinion and experience. I'm not representing Dr. David Bricelli. I'm not officially representing the TRE organization. I am a certified practitioner through them. I've taught two, two to four patients per day for the last three and a half years how to do the TREs. They saved my own life. I was trying to die in a hospital bed about three and a half years ago. So um, I've got a lot of experience with this. I've taught a number of group classes. So this is just my opinion and experience I'm not proposing that this is the only way or the way this should be done. I'm just sharing my experience and how I deal with these sensitive, uh, fragile clients. So number one and the most important thing with this is if you're seeing these clients, you as the practitioner have to be in your own social engagement system, okay? You can't be amped up in some fight or flight state. You can't certainly can't be frozen. I was uh, pretty much frozen for the first 50 something years of my life. You've got to be in your social engagement system. I can tell you from the time I started doing TREs three and a half years ago to now, I'm having just magnitudes of greater success with the patients as my own container has grown. Now, I do my own work. I do TREs four or five times a week. I worked with several different uh, high level practitioners, built my own container. I feel like I bring a lot of safety to the session. And these days there's almost no patients that I see with any history of trauma that have anything to grab on to in me. It's all pretty clear, not perfect, but it's all pretty clear. And it's a pretty big container of safety. That's number one. Be in your own social engagement system. 
be doing your own TREs regularly, maybe work with a practitioner. Now, number two, when I work with these patients, I do not do these standing exercises. I feel like for this cohort of patients, A, it may be a little too activating to do the standing TRE exercises. B, in my experience, 99.5% of patients get great tremors just by starting in the laying or ground position. Okay, so I, I don't need them. Now, when I first start doing TRE with this cohort of patients, I'll lay them down, I'll offer them a blanket or sheet, before we start any of the exercises, I want them to find a area of safety in their body. I want them to find a safe place in their body. Do not blow this off. This is extremely important for this cohort of patients. Now, I had a, a client recently, she's got some autoimmune disease, chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia, significant trauma history, and I told her, lay down on the table, and first of all, just scan your body and notice what you notice. Now, her body felt horrible. And guess what, folks? That's not just her. I'd say 99% of people in the world, if they actually just sit down, be still, and notice what they notice in their body. They're not trying to meditate and still their mind. They're not distracting themselves with overeating, overdrinking, on their cell phone texting, and just notice what they notice in their body. Most of us, the body really does not feel that good, okay? She at least had the insight to say, man, my body feels like crap. It feels horrible. I feel scared. I said, okay, well, just be with that for a moment. And then I said, I want you to find a, bot, a place in your body that feels the opposite of that or that feels safe or comfortable. Now, I've had fibromyalgia patients that the only place in their body that felt comfortable or safe was their little toe and their left foot. And I've said, that's great. Then you noticed that part of your body, okay? Now, in this person's case, her forearms and hands felt safe, they felt comfortable, they felt grounded. So I said, shift your attention from this rest of your body that doesn't feel like that to the safe, comfortable part of your body, in this case, the, the forearms and hands. I had her notice that for about 30 seconds. We shifted her awareness and attention back to the, uh, attention back to the other parts of her body. Then we went back to her forearms and hands again. We pendulated back and forth. Now, Dr. Peter Levine, uh, is one of the most brilliant authors I've ever read. I think he, he's got a lot of this down correctly. He talks about pendulation. Pendulation means noticing where in your body you feel something, you know, perhaps something bad, but also realizing that there's other parts of your body that feel good and that you have the ability to shift your awareness and attention to a part of your body that feels good or feels safe. Now, I'll tell you my own experience up until a month ago, I used to still have a little bit of residual freeze in my entire arms. And so if I take a nap or just be sitting and meditating, my arms would begin to feel stiff and powerless. It was a horrible feeling. I've been trying my whole life to get away from that feeling. If I ever had open expanses of time where something wasn't scheduled, the arms just felt dead and numb and powerless. It was a horrendous feeling. Now, for many, many decades, I've done things like Notice that with a non-judgmental awareness. You know, Gay Hendricks talks about presencing. Notice something with non-judgmental awareness. I would notice the sensations in the arms. I I'd, I'd, wouldn't label it, judge it, you know, all the things I tell patients and clients to do. I'd be with it and I'd go deeper and deeper. What I just realized about a month ago is that there were also big parts of my body this part, at this point that actually feel energized and empowered. And I never once realized experientially that I could shift my awareness and attention to these other places because I was so locked into the parts that were feeling bad. It was a huge epiphany and a huge healing for me to shift my awareness and attention to other parts. I realized my whole gut and belly felt great. My lower part of my body, my head felt super expansive. I shifted my awareness and attention to those other parts. Now, this is not a thinking thing. This is not abstractions and concepts. This is shifting your awareness and attention noticing the raw sensations of parts that feel okay. Shift back to the noticing the bad stuff. We're not thinking about it, figuring anything out. Just notice with awareness, like a cat watches a mouse hole. Noticing the good part, shifting back and forth at about 20 or 30 second intervals. Just knowing that we can do that, that we can pendulate, that there are places in our body that feels good is priceless, it's worth its weight in gold. You cannot pendulate unless you start with feeling an area of the body that feels safe and getting grounded there and spending a little time there. So with this client today, 
She felt a scary feeling in a big part of her body, including her chest, in her face. We had her notice that. We shifted her awareness and attention to her forearms and hands, went back to this part, went back to the forearms and hands, back and forth four or five times. Now, the second thing that I feel is useful, because Peter Levine says that patients that are, particularly patients that are fragile, sensitive, they have sensations in their bodies that is linked or coupled to fear. There are sensations in their body that are attached, linked, coupled to fear. Okay, they're just sensations. So what I found very useful over the years is that when people tell me there's an emotion in their body, I'll say, where do you notice it inside? Okay, I wanna bring their attention back to their body. I'll say, can you notice that as a raw physical sensation right now? And then I'll say, if you would, just for now, let's not put a label on it. Like, oh, that's, that's guilt, that's anxiety, that's sadness, that's hurt, you know? I had one woman tell me one time, she had some t tension in her throat, and she said, oh, that's my ex-husband. So that's taking a sensation, putting a metaphor or story or something like that on it. I said, ma'am, I'm sure your boyfriend's way too big to have his whole body in your throat. That's not him. There's a sensation. Let's just for now remove that label or that meaning, move it off to the side, okay? I want people in their body noticing sensations letting those sensations be there so we're not resisting them. Remember the adage, what we resist persists. We're not resisting sensations, we're letting them be there. Um, we're not adding labels to them, we're not doing our best to not add meaning, we're doing our best to let whatever raw sensations are there be there to such an extent, we're not even judging them as good or bad. When people let go of their resistance to feeling their sensations, which is easier when you're not adding labels, thinking about it, figuring out, they, they usually their whole body relaxes, these patients take a big belly breath as my patient did today. So after starting slow with me and my social engagement system, that's so important, working within my scope of practice, that's so important, finding a place of safety first, that's important, having the patient notice things in her body as raw physical sensation without labeling them, adding meaning, judging them, thinking about them, figuring anything out, we're getting them out of their head, into their body, pendulating back and forth, giving her the realization that she could move from some of these uncomfortable areas to safe, grounded, comfortable areas. Only after that, only after that, did we start doing the TREs. Now, with, in my experience, how I practice this with sensitive, fragile patients, I do not do the standing exercises. We start on the ground. We do the resting position. We do the pelvic lift. When I do the pelvic lift for folks like this, I put their feet flat on the floor and they lift their butt. I do not do a pelvic lift from the feet together in the resting position. Um, I think that's much less stimulating, activating for them. We finish doing the ground exercises. Then we start tremoring and I'll have these patients tremor for 15 to 30 seconds. That's it. Then they straighten their legs, okay? I had them lay there for a minute. Once they straighten their legs, I say, tell me when the tremors stop, and they'll tell you when the tremors stop, and then I'll say, who's in control? Because I want them to realize they can straighten their legs, they're in control. After about a minute, almost every one of you actually go, you know, let, Dr. Berselli always says, less is more. With these sensitive, fragile patients, a little bit of tremoring, the way I explain tremoring to these folks, by the way, is this, I say, if you imagine you have a can of soda, you shake up the can, it pressurizes the can of soda, now, of course, we don't just want to rip the lid off of the can because it'll explode everywhere, but we just want to crack the lid so we go, pss, pss. We're slowly, safely letting pressure out of the can. So 20 or 30 seconds, what I want to convey here, 20 or 30 seconds of tremoring is extremely powerful. It's extremely effective. One of the biggest things I like to convey with TRE, less is more, and a little bit of tremoring, particularly in this cohort of patients, is extremely powerful. Almost all of them notice big shifts in their body. They feel relaxed. They feel like their mind has slowed down. They have more of a feeling of hope or emotional well-being, okay? So I might do a 20 or 30 second set of tremoring, straighten the legs for a minute. I might do a second 20 or 30 second thing of tremoring, straighten the legs and we're done. And that's what they go home on, okay? We do not want, the, the TREs exercises tend to unfreeze the physiology, which is awesome, we wanna do that, we want, we, but we do not wanna unfreeze too much too fast, have too much emotional junk, 
have too much of their deep pain come up to their conscious awareness to be dealt with. Um, and that's it. Their, uh, their homework is, again, just do these, just what we did in the, in the office. 20, 30 seconds of tremoring, straighten the legs for a minute. Second, 20 or 30 seconds of tremoring, straighten the legs, you're done. Slow, safe, conservative. Start with, a, start with a finding safety in their body and pendulating that. Um, and these patients do great. And then, of course, we can slowly go up after that. I hope this video is helpful. Um, give me your feedback. My email address is hypnomd at aol.com. Thanks so much.